Hi everyone, this is Rich, just letting you know that we are live on Vimeo, YouTube, and Facebook, as well as nrm.org. Greetings, friends. I'm Laurie Norton Moffat, Director and CEO of Norman Rockwell Museum. It is my pleasure to welcome you today 
Thank you for joining us on this national day on which we honor the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King for a discussion of Norman Rockwell Museum's upcoming exhibition imprinted Illustrating Race. You'll be able to see it at the museum and through many virtual program offerings like this one beginning in June. This exhibit is the result of many months of work by an exceptional group of national scholars, curators, and artists. We are very grateful for their leadership and insight. Imprinted is co-curated by Robin Phillips Pendleton, University of Delaware Professor of Visual Communications, whose thesis forms the basis of the exhibition, and by the museum's Deputy Director and Chief Curator, Stephanie Habush Plunkett. Many funders who believe in the importance of the project are making the exhibition possible. We thank Steven Spielberg and Kate Capshaw's Hearthland Foundation, major sponsor, travelers, and project support from the Tara Foundation for American Art. Sponsors also include Berkshire Bank, the Dr. Robert C. and Tina Sohn Foundation, the Upper Housatonic Heritage Area, and Mass Humanities, the funding made possible by the National Endowment for the Humanities, and TD Bank is providing curriculum development support. Our discussion today and the focus of the exhibition is to explore the role of published images in shaping our perceptions of race and culture. The exhibition examines historical stereotypical racial representations that have been imprinted upon us through the mass publication of images. It culminates with the creative accomplishments of contemporary artists and publishers who have shifted the cultural narrative through the creation of positive, inclusive imagery, emphasizing full agency and equity for all. It's important to become aware how illustration influences our cultural perceptions. Images can lift us up and they can be deployed to establish negative and demeaning perceptions as happened often with intention during formative centuries of published images in the United States. It is our hope that this exploration and its related programs will help us all to gain deeper understanding of how images uh, that have been published may have affected our own perceptions and beliefs. We hope that the voices represented in the exhibition together that with their inspiring stories will bring us all closer together in mutual understanding. Before I introduce our co-curators, I would like to invite you to direct any questions you have to the Q&A on the bottom of your screen for discussion at the conclusion of the curator's presentation. And now please welcome Robin Phillips Pendleton and Stephanie Plunkett. Good afternoon, everyone. It is wonderful to see you. We're very thankful that you've taken time this afternoon to uh, spend with us and to hear a little bit about the work that we've been doing. Uh, as Lori said, we are uh, an institution, one of the rare ones actually, that is focused solely on the art of illustration. So we have uh, really been fortunate to collect and also present many exhibitions focused on art that is mass circulated. Art that without us thinking about it has a tremendous impact on the way we think and feel about things. Um, and in many ways, it is hidden in plain sight sometimes. Uh, it has actually been a great honor for me to work with Robin Phillips Pendleton on this exhibition, Imprinted, Illustrating Race, uh, as well as our um, very talented uh, scholars and, and curators and artists who've had such important input into our themes and our topic. And uh, what I'm gonna do is, put up a PowerPoint that will take you through probably about three centuries, I imagine, of, um, of images that we will discuss. And um, what I'd actually like to do is to start here and um, just to say that in terms of Robin's scholarship, uh, Robin has been working on this theme for quite a few years now, in fact, um, some years ago when we were working on our Four Freedoms exhibition, uh, which Robin was an advisor to, uh, she was already formulating uh, her study of the effect of published art on the way we look at the concept of race. So Robin, I wonder if you might start by um, just telling us a little bit about 
maybe what we're seeing here, and also um, how you began to think about this topic and why you felt it was so important. Well, thank you uh, so much, Stephanie, um, and the Norman Rockwell Museum and Laurie for the introduction. Um, thank you for having me on this wonderful uh, Martin Luther King Day. Um, this has uh, been a really interesting journey for me um, because I am an illustrator. Um, I'm also um, a professor and I teach illustration and design. Um, so this really came out of um, a really casual conversation or conversations I was having with uh, some fellow illustrators um, of color. And we were comparing um, our illustration journey, um, things that went on, things that happened um, while we were creating illustrations for different um, platforms. And I mean, uh, so how that process um, seemed different for illustrators of color. Um, one of my illustration friends was mistaken for the delivery person uh, when he went to uh, deliver his illustration to a major magazine. Um, one of my other illustrator friends um, was asked if he could uh, create um, portraits of white people, that he only, they only thought that he could uh, create images of blacks. So I started thinking about, well, if this was the contemporary idea um, by editors and art directors, then what might have been going on um, centuries ago? And what kinds of illustrations were being presented and by whom? And who commissioned those illustrations? And for what purpose? What platforms? And I really began to discover um, just sort of the, the omissions, the uh, blatant stereotypes, um, the narratives that were put in play um, and saturated our society for centuries. But also, um, also I discovered some I already knew, but I also discovered how um, the tide of illustration and stereotypes were um, turned in at a certain time frame, and uh, due to uh, the black press and different events that happened in history, so I realized a lot of these illustrations were created specifically for certain causes for uh, certain identities, for certain ideas, ideals, and concepts that permeated through American history. Robin, you had mentioned to me that when you were um, beginning to explore this topic, Norman Rockwell um, kind of came to the surface. And this is an interesting piece um, called Boy in Dining Car from 1946. Um, and it represents in many ways the way that African-Americans, at least at mid-century for the major magazines, were presented if they were presented at all. Uh, that they would have been presented in service roles, um, even if in the case of Rockwell, um, with a sense of warmth and humanity. But, um, you know, there were strictures in place in terms of the way that people of color could specifically be represented. And so I wondered if you'd say a little bit about how, um, you know, that idea uh, as connected to Rockwell and others uh, sort of influenced you. Um, it influenced me uh, because during this research, I really followed the images and wrote the research and wrote the um, articles and the presentations around the images. Images. One image led into another. Uh, I researched Rockwell um, quite a bit and realized he was unhappy with illustrating for the Saturday Evening Post. And you know, as rach as racial uh, uh, tensions really rose during his time as an illustrator, he was very popular as an illustrator. 
um, he became really, really uh, disenchanted with what he was doing and knowing that his editor would not allow him to uh, show Blacks in uh, different roles other than subservient on the covers of um, the Saturday Evening Post. And this was one of the reasons why he chose to leave and go to Look Magazine. So maybe we can actually take people back to some of the earlier pieces that we are exploring. Um, so for example, this is an engraving, uh, actually on the right, that depicts three African slaves who are newly arrived on the shores of Virginia. And uh, on the left, an advertisement for the sale of enslaved Africans. Do you wanna sort of jump yeah. in? This is okay. one of the, the first known advertisements um, for that, that appeared and showed um, Blacks in, in the media. Um, this was a type, and they used type specimens for these images. So this is when type uh, and image first had a relationship um, with the subject matter of, of Blacks. And they were also used in, in posters, advertisements and posters. This is an interesting piece because it was actually produced by the American Anti-Slavery Society. And I think as you've pointed out, there were limited numbers of images that could be used um, and that many were repeated on various broadsides and posters. So they would have been very familiar to the American public. Yes, there were only um, a few of these images readily available to printers. So they used them for pro-slavery and anti-slavery um, ideas. And this piece, interestingly, uh, is designed to try to point out the disparity between the concept of slavery and that of freedom and democracy. So on the left-hand side, the images uh, published by this organization deal with uh, someone moving from freedom into slavery, and on the right-hand side, symbols of um, a freedom which did not coincide. How ironic. Yes. <laughs> uh, Harper's Weekly, Gleason's Pictorial, Drawing Room Companion, uh, Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. These were important publications, Robin, in your research, as I understand it. Yes, they were. Um, they were the major newspapers of the time. Um, they used offset printing. They used uh, illustrators, engravers, artists, editors. Everyone was involved in creating these narratives, whether they were pro-slavery or um, anti-slavery. So sometimes an illustrator would create an image and it would be changed by the engraver. So there were different points in the process of creating these newspapers where things changed, depending on who was working on the, the, uh, the paper at that time. Interestingly, this one actually pertains to a particular event. Uh, the central figure who's appearing as an orator is actually a reformer named Wendell Phillips. And um, he called this meeting, which uh, in this illustration anyway, is comprised of both whites and blacks, uh, to protest the case of Thomas Sims, who was a fugitive slave and um, was, uh, basically about to be returned to slavery. And so unfortunately the fight uh, for Sims freedom did not work out very well because he was actually returned to Savannah, Georgia where he was um, enslaved again. So here, um, this shows one of the original illustrations for 
um, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And the book written by um, Harry Beecher Stowe, she commissioned the six original illustrations by Hammett Billings. Um, it was the best-selling novel of the 19th century. It sold over 300,000 copies worldwide. Um, and there was mass hysteria around um, all the memorabilia, the posters, minstrel shows, theater. Um, they even made lamps um, from, <laughs> from this story. Um, it was not copywritten. So that lent itself to many different interpretations of the story uh, during uh, 1852. But the main reason Harry Beecher Stowe wrote the novel was because she wanted peop more people to be sympathetic to uh, anti-slavery. And she wanted to sow the seeds um, for people to understand what slavery was like. So on the left, this is one of the uh, images, but it was one of the most um, uh, important images because Uncle Tom here is a middle-aged black man. And some people became very upset because he was middle-aged, but he was also alone with a teenage white girl who also had her hand on his knee. And in the image on the right, this is uh, sheet music also showing Uncle Tom as a middle-aged um, man. And that representation Uncle. ultimately shifts at least to some degree mm -hmm. to it make Uncle Tom a much more grandfatherly figure. Yes, and, and really that happened based on um, people being upset that he was middle-aged and uncomfortable with his age and, his, and the way that he looked in illustrations of the time. So they, the interpretation, um, they interpreted him in, into a much older character. And he never went back. He never went back to the middle age uh, black man that he was originally uh, written into the story to be. This gives a sense of just how, um, impactful the story was. It actually became, you know, the characters were integrated, uh, not just into uh, literary, various literary publications, but also into advertisements such as the ones that you see here. Uh, and here, the much more grandfatherly of mm -hmm. the depictions. And also different versions uh, came out of that too. Different versions like Uncle Ben's um, was also a play on Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yeah. Um, this is actually a rather remarkable hand colored print. Um, one of the ways that uh, imagery uh, was also widely spread in addition to newspapers and magazines and broadsides was uh, through a mass circulated prints that people could purchase for a relatively nominal sum and this is called the miscegenation ball, which um, refers to the intermingling of the races. And uh, it's a fictionalized account of a Republican campaign event dance that occurred at the Lincoln Central Campaign Club in New York in September of 1864. So this is preceding Abraham Lincoln's uh, sec election to a second term. And Robin, I wonder if you want to address kind of what people are seeing here. Um, and this, this image was also interesting because it was based on a previous image called the New Union Club um, that was created in Britain um, that played on the fear and paranoia that um, Blacks and whites would commingle. And this is the way that America would be if Lincoln was elected. And so um, Lincoln won his second term, but he lost in the state of New York where this print uh, was widely circulated. Um, contemporarily, um, this image has shown up in the Atlantic um, 
in uh, 2013 and also referenced um, by uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, oh, in the Atlantic and uh, also the Daily Beast. Um, so it has a lot of reference um, during the time of um, Obama's candidacy and, um, and in different political conversations. You know, I'll just mention that, um, interestingly, Kimmel and Foster, which is the uh, print company, and then the distributor, G.W. Bromley, um, following Lincoln's assassination, they, they produced a series of prints that were very pro-Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So as Robin points out, um, you know, the publishing industry was an industry that was designed to uh, make money. And so whatever the, the popular themes were, there would be shifts in that regard. Um, I'd like to say that th this is a time where the communication uh, through text and image in Harper's Weekly um, and the uh, major illustrator uh, illustration uh, publications that Stephanie mentioned uh, prior during the 19th century, but also um, these newspapers were bound by the, the advancements uh, made in printing processes. So the circulation of these papers and the kind of high-tech advancement during the time um, where one played off of another. Um, but also as these newspapers circulated, the widespread ideas of race accompanied these advancements. Um, the steam driven press was invented in 1830 and with the expansion of the postal system and helped uh, increase the production and circulation of the papers as did the, illustrate, the illustrations that ran in these publications. Um, but Harper's Weekly, Frank Leslie's uh, newspaper, um, they were major illustrated newspapers that brought pictures of important people um, and news to the American public. But they were also the cheapest way to provide images um, to mass audiences before halftone processes. This is a, a piece done by uh, Thomas Nast, um, one of the leading illustrators um, for Harper's Weekly. And he received many opportunities to illustrate these double page uh, spreads. Um, he was also the creator of the political symbols um, for the Democrat and Republicans, the donkey and the elephant that many of you may be familiar with. Um, this image was, uh, most of his images uh, during this time were showing Blacks as, um, you know, straightforward and in realism. Um, and showed some racial subtleties, but most, most of his work um, during the early part of, of uh, the pre-Civil War, during Civil War, um, were pretty straightforward. So interestingly, this was issued just weeks after the Emancipation Proclamation. It's actually in many ways a, a hopeful piece. In fact, down at the bottom, if you look closely, uh, the New Year's baby is actually breaking the shackles of a slave. And it actually moves on the left-hand side from terrible scenes of enslavement to um, much more hopeful uh, scenarios, particularly the, the families seen in the middle. And in fact, they're gathered around a union stove, which I found kind of interesting. Um, Nast himself had uh, generally liberal points of view, uh, which were often projected in his illustrations, though, as Robin and I uh, sort of have, have observed, uh, he certainly presented opposite viewpoints as well. And this piece by Nast, again, another double page uh, spread. And this was two years after the previous um, piece that we showed. Um, and this was around, this was, this piece was actually done for the 4th of July, 
Um, so peace on earth and goodwill towards men, but it still shows um, blacks in a subservient position being lower uh, placed, um, more lowly placed in the composition and the emphasis being on the white family. Um, this is where, you know, things get really interesting um, by illustration standards and historical standards. Um, so as Lincoln was assassinated um, in 1865, um, the 13th Amendment um, was that outlawed slavery uh, was passed, but the status of 4 million Blacks was in question. So this piece was done in 1868. There are slave codes that were enacted right after um, emancipation. So um, they took the place of the slave laws. So white Southerners reestablished authority in the former Confederate states. The laws were designed to prohibit the activity, the rights and availab uh, availability of freed Blacks um, for, and for labor because the free labor no longer existed. So there was no labor. Um, and it was sort of by any means necessary to get people to work the land and to do all of the things that uh, slavery provided. So these black codes turned into uh, the Jim Crow laws of the Southern states. Um, so these laws stood for um, almost a century until the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1864 and the Voting Rights Act was passed in 18, uh, in 1965. Um, so this piece, this piece shows um, that Blacks held office um, in the state of Mississippi, I mean, uh, the state of uh, Louisiana, but also in other Southern states, however, how briefly. I'll just mention that the full length portrait in the center is a portrait of Oscar J. Dunn, who was Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana at the time. He is seated at the desk. And then there are 29 head and shoulders portraits of uh, delegates to the Louisiana Constitutional Convention. So along with um, the kind of breakdown of, of Reconstruction, um, you know, the Freedmen's Bureau was created. And this figure in the middle um, represented the Freedmen's Bureau. It was established in 1865 uh, by Congress to help millions of former uh, Black slaves and poor whites in the South in the aftermath of the Civil War. So it provided food, housing, and medical aid, established schools, and offered legal assistance. Also attempted to settle former slaves on confiscated or abandoned land during the war. It was meant to be uh, temporary. Um, Oliver Howard, one of its founders, and the head of the Freedmen's Bureau served um, as a Washington, D.C., uh, Harvard Univer uh, Howard University, HBCU, who served as president from 1869 um, to 1864. But this image shows how uh, free slaves and poor whites were at odds with one another because of land and everybody was fighting over uh, land and food and just trying to survive uh, during that time. Uh, so this is a, another work by Thomas Nast, and um, it's just interesting to note that in, in 1863, uh, President Lincoln actually proclaimed that Thanksgiving was to be celebrated on the fourth Thursday in November. Um, however, the Civil War actually interrupted national observance, and um, so it, it actually prevented Lincoln ad adversaries, uh, old Lincoln adversaries from accepting the proclamation. Um, this Thanksgiving scene was published a year before it became a national holiday. And um, basically it's essentially Ness 
what you might consider at the time a radical Republican vision of America after the Civil War. Um, what is interesting about it is that Ness tried to gather what, what he perceived as um, people from nations and cultures around the world. Um, but with having them gather around the Thanksgiving table, uh, he doesn't necessarily consider that there may be other traditions uh, that would supersede this particular one, which had now uh, been established in America. And of course you see uh, the three presidents or three presidents overseeing uh, this dinner. So Lincoln and um, Washington and Grant. Robin, did you wanna add anything here? No, not yet. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, I'll, uh, so by the late uh, 1800s, this, th these two pieces were also created by NAST and you can see the stylistic changes that took place. And they took place mainly because of the turning sentiment um, of freed slaves and you know this whole idea that um, blacks would be in Congress. And so on the left, um, he depicts blacks in Congress and this is how they would behave. You know, He's depicting them as the unruly bunch while the white members of Congress are the, the more calm um, of the group. And this gets into the civil rights um, on the right. Um, you can see the civil rights uh, in underneath the arm of the uh, main figure. Um, and just the idea of if civil rights were violated that the perpetrator would pay $500. Um, but he, he does, NAS does this in a sort of a visual, um, as a visual joke, really. Yeah, interestingly, um, as you observe the way that NAS drawing evolves in these pieces, it's far more caricatured than it was in some of the earlier things that we looked at. And uh, the one on the right actually refers to the Civil Rights Act of 1875. And that was basically the last of the major reconstruction statutes, uh, which was supposed to guarantee African-Americans equal treatment in public transportation and public accommodations and service. So you see on the right-hand side, there's somebody standing behind a desk with a, a guest book. And um, you, know, you just, as, as Robin said, I think it is a kind of a satirical point of view um, and yes, uh, businesses were supposed to be fined $1,000 if they did not comply. And people who were wronged were supposed to receive $500. Uh, I'm not sure how that really worked. Highly unlikely. Um, so here's a a, an example of um, editors, illustrators, and artists working together. Um, this is an engraving that shows um, a battle. Um, it's created by uh, the Theodore Davis, one of the major illustrators of the time who mainly created work um, that showed Native Americans and life out West. Um, a lot of these battles were uh, created by illustrators, but most of them were made up. Most of the illustrators never left their uh, homes on, on the East Coast. Um, this image also depicts uh, rail, the railroad, the construction of the railroad. Um, and so more newspapers were being sold, the more battles that were created in these images, the more newspapers were sold, but also the more people decided to um, uproot from the East Coast and move out West because they were so infuriated by these ideas and uh, these visual ideas, but they were made up. So that's where, you know, illustrators, um, you know, really, uh, you know, 
grasped a lot of power um, and also the pictorial press. One of the things that's interesting to consider is that after the Civil War, um, publications needed to find additional dramatic events that would help them to sell uh, their publications. Mm -hmm. And um, Theodore Davis was actually considered one of what they called the special illustrators who actually would go out west and um, you know, kind of insert himself into various scenarios that were happening. Um, so this notion of manifest destiny uh, and movement out west and the battle between uh, native people and um, you know others whites going out west was a constant and regular topic and it was meant to create both a sense of fear and a sense of fascination um, here is uh, an image by Sol Atenge, who was a um, kind of a satirical comic illustrator um, for Harper's uh, Weekly. Um, he created a series um, uh, for the small breeds. Um, and in this sort of magical place or, or uh, um, you know, fictional place called Blackville. And these images were sort of like a visual comedy um, of Blacks doing absurd things. He would depict Blacks with um, bulging eyes, big lips, and doing something uh, absurd. Um, and the end result of, of that, of, of these, the series was that Harper's Weekly sold more newspapers. So people, it was sort of a, a uh, uh, sitcom <clears throat> in print media, as it were. Um, people would sort of tune in for each episode of The Small Breeds, you know, by buying these newspapers. Um, the Dark Town series, um, by Courier and Ives, the print house. Um, they picked up on the idea of creating these, these uh, series and they printed um, these absurd images um, in color. And one of, one of the, um, they gained momentum after one of these prints sold 75,000 copies. Um, the prints were also uh, collected worldwide and um, by the um, English royalty. So these, these images by Courier and Ives were mass created and mass um, collected. Yeah, it's actually remarkable to think about the numbers in which they were absorbed into society. Um, they began publishing the Dark Town comic series in 1870, and by 1884, uh, it represented a third of their overall production. So you can see how pervasive uh, this scenario would have been. What's also interesting too, is that if you Google Courier and Ives, and Stephanie and I have done this, you know, if you'll, what will come up is, you know, sort of puppies and flowers and, you know, it's very, very difficult contemporarily to find um, these images associated with Courier and Ives. They're buried sort of deep into, you know, into the internet searches. Mm -hmm. um, the city of New York um, was the center of American art through its artists, publishing, and theater. It played a major role in the development of minstrelsy and the negative images of Blacks in popular media and, uh, and spread of Southern notions about Blacks in the North through exaggeration um, and simplification of imagery. Um, 
So the, the most of the menstrual mm-hmm. shows were an expression of plantation myths, like a plantation life and the myths around that. Um, also a uh, function to create an image of blacks um, and to um, promote white Southern interests, you know, such as uh, Jim Crow and believe that the most Whites in the North believed that the what was going on in these menstrual shows and, and plantation life and everything associated with it was factual when it was in fact not. One of the ways that uh, stereotypical imagery was circulated was through advertisements and trade cards. And uh, particularly with trade cards, it was a very inexpensive way for advertisers to circulate um, visuals that promoted their products. Also, um, the Charles Darwin's popular theory of evolution was, uh, was really, uh, popular, um, during that time and where humans, um, were evolved from primitive ape. And this really, uh, started in 1859, um, so a lot of this Darwinism came forth in the advertising um, uh, cards. So manufacturers look to advertise and communicate about uh, inventions, products, and services before the end of the, the Civil War. Um, and it contained a lot of the um, uh, racist imagery. But after the Civil War, Blacks began to live in their own communities and members of the working class with limited freedoms. Um, so these illustrations were used for food labels, appliances, cars. Some of the uh, companies were Van Heusen, General Electric, Kellogg's, B&G Foods, Borden's. Um, that's just to name, name a few. Um, One of the famous images um, is this portrait of uh, Nancy Green for R.T. RT Davis Milling Company, the company that that created uh, uh, Aunt Jemima pancake flour. She's the first living uh, advertising trademark. So Nancy Green is a real person and she went around to trade shows and festivals and fairs representing uh, the company. But this illustration of Nancy Green was created by A.B. Frost. Um, And so the stereotypes affected how uh, black women saw themselves in the the headscarf um, and represented a whole idea about around hair and the treatment of the hair. So hats and headscarves were you know, um, had social codes attached to them. And so there was also, there were these layers of, uh, of what images like this represented. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, the mammy, you know, the mammy was, um, you know, kind of a made up character to represent how um, this person who, Um, was supposed to cook clean and take care of um, the house on the plantation. So it was this character, not only was it Nancy Green in this painting, but it was, you know, this mass representation of, you know, Southern comfort on the plantations. And you can see how uh, the image of Aunt Jemima was integrated into a variety of advertisements. And of course, the Quaker Oats Company uh, did very recently acknowledge that Aunt Jemima was based upon a racial stereotype and stopped using that. Most of these images, um, you know, solidified Blacks in a subservient role. also in the character of uh, Rastus for the cream of wheat. Um, Uncle Ben's also. Yeah, uh, interestingly, Rastus is 
the name of an African-American character who first appeared on packages of cream of, cream of wheat cereal in 1893. And his, his image remained on the packaging until the 1920s. Um, but he was ultimately replaced by a photograph of Frank White, who was a Chicago chef in a chef's hat. Uh, but the name Rastus actually came down through Joel Chandler Harris's Uncle Remus stories. There was a character named Rare Rastus in the stories. Uh, but it is uh, amazing the number of American illustrators who actually used Rastus uh, or painted Rastus in a variety of scenarios. So here on the left, we have a drawing by Jesse Wilcox Smith. And um, this would have been a fairly typical scenario where there would be a white child um, either interacting with a picture of Rastus or being overseen by Rastus or served um, cereal by, by this character. This is a, another piece by um, A.B. Frost. A.B. Frost did the original a portrait of, Aunt, of, of Nancy Green, um, Aunt Jemima. And so this, this is also a piece uh, done in pen and ink by A.B. Frost. So the illustrators of the time, they use different mediums, they, um, and for different reasons. So, you know, he created an, an image for advertisement, but here's also a, an editorial um, sort of comic type piece. Um, for Life magazine. And of course, the characteristics of each figure are vastly exaggerated in comparison to this piece, which is also by Frost, um, which has much more psychological and subtle undertones uh, and is much more naturalistically painted. I found a lot of these, you know, comparative um, illustrations to be fascinating in my research like one illustrator could do so many could do a range of create a range of imagery images but also use a range of medium to do this depending on who the illustrator worked for depending on who the the uh the editorial or director was or the art director was and whatever the purpose you know they would change what, what their style was and, and how, um, um, how stereotypical they would make uh, Blacks. So it was really interesting to me, you know, again, the power of, of the illustration. So magazines like, like Puck, um, they made a lot of money circulating um, their magazines using these images for um, uh, immigration and um, making fun of most ethnicities who immigrated to the United States. And as you can see, um, you know, Uncle Sam kind of commanding the room um, where everyone is, uh, every non-white character here is um, stylized in some way in a stereotypical way. And the white children are in the back, um, you know, being dutif dutifully reading um, their books. And oftentimes works like this would be tied to a particular historical event that was happening at the time. So for example, um, the Spanish-American War occurred in 1898 and its concluding treaty um, was actually signed just one month before Puck published this. So one major component of that treaty was that Spain gave the United States control over the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. So you start to see that reflected here um, in the characters and you know, then of course in the way that the characters are drawn. Mm -hmm. And these ideas um, work through different magazines of the time, like the Saturday Evening uh, Post. Um, this version of the assimilation into uh, America, 
Um, but notice there are no women. You know, so uh, there, there are all kinds of messages, um, you know, ingrained in these, these illustrations of the time. And this piece uh, published in um, 1921 relates to the Emergency Quota Act that year, which actually established the nation's first numerical limit on the number of immigrants who could enter the United States. And then in 1924, the Immigration Act actually even tightened those limits. That was known as the National Origins Act. Um, but the notion that just by changing the headgear uh, of individuals coming into the country uh, would establish them as Americans, tried and true Americans is an interesting one to consider. And then we have the Wasp magazine um, that was an anti-Chinese satirical magazine of the late 1800s. So um, this illustration was in response to uh, thousands of Chinese immigrating to California for the gold rush and then later on for the railroad. Um, so as Chinese laborers grew um, and some of them, a lot of them became really successful um, Anti-Chinese uh, sentiment followed that, um, and with it, legislation uh, to limit future immigration of Chinese workers, known as the Chinese Exclusion Act. So here we have an image um, of, for the Crisis magazine that it showed um, the violence that um, blacks were escaping in the South. Um, so lynching and mob violence accompanied the Jim Crow laws. And as a result, uh, 250 to 500,000 um, black people left the South. They also left the Caribbean um, for cities like Chicago, Detroit, and New York in pursuit of better jobs, education, living conditions, and escaping the the, the mob violence. And so, um, I don't know if you wanted to say anything. Uh, well, I'll just mention that the crisis um, was the legendary African-American magazine that began publication in 1910. Um, and it actually remains in print today. It was published under the sponsorship of the NAACP and it was the most widely read and distributed magazine of the Harlem Renaissance. And uh, it was um, created uh, by Chief Editor W.E.B. Uh, w. Du Bois, who oversaw uh, the publication until 1933. So um, one of the things that I think is interesting is that Du Bois actually encouraged um, artists of color to use their art to um, move forward uh, aspects of social justice. And, um, and many did. And so with the migration um, came writers, musician, and artists. Uh, New, York, New York became the central point of the concept of the new Negro movement, a concept by, Al, by Elaine Lope to move the idea of the black race from the plantation slave to a more progressive and sophisticated intellectual uh, Negro. Um, this marked the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance. And so Aaron Douglas, as you see um, in these two pieces by Aaron Douglas, um, he was tasked with sort of changing that identity of, of who Americans associated blacks to be. Um, and it was because of his distinctive graphic style um, that, that uh, encompassed African forms with modernism. Um, he and other Black illustrators created illustrations mainly for um, Black-owned and edited publications um, like The Crisis and The Opportunity. Uh, these are examples of other publications that also featured um, literature and uh, artwork 
by uh, African-American artists. Gwendolyn Bennett is actually featured on the left in Opportunity, a journal of Negro life. And um, that basically chronicled cultural advancements during the Har Harlem Renaissance. And Gwendolyn Bennett was an artist, a writer, and a journalist. And on the right-hand side, uh, a piece done about 10 years later, very strong piece by Aaron Douglas. And also a um, cover of the crisis. By, this is by William McKnight Farrow, who was a, uh, an artist and curator in the early 20th century. And he was recognized as a printmaker in his own right. But, um, you know, it's really a beautiful, almost Art Nouveau mm -hmm. design and uh, using Art Deco styles um, in a couple in a very natural setting, vacation setting. So um, really important um, introduction of themes such as this. Um, another important artist of the Harlem Renaissance was Lois Melo Jones. And one of the things that was very interesting to Robin and I is that she was among the first artists to begin introducing African-American children into picture books. Mm -hmm. um, it's widely thought that Ezra Jack Keats' The Snowy Day was the first to do this, but uh, these are actually quite a bit earlier in the 1920s and 30s. And again, very beautiful, um, stylized, but magical uh, introduction of children. And you can see how, how diverse the styles are, um, you know, by black illustrators and just this whole identity change. Um, you know, and even though the, uh, publications were black owned. I mean, th th there, there was such an expression, you know, of pride and, and beauty. Um, this is Charles Dawson, um, an illustrator and graphic designer in Chicago. And he, this poster was for the Chicago World Fair. Um, it's Oh Sing a New Song. This was in 1933. He also uh, created all of the images and uh, design work for the uh, Valmer's um, Black Hair Care um, company that was owned um, and operated by a Jewish husband and wife team um, for nearly 60 years. During the mid 20th century, um, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, American magazines uh, portray generally people of color in roles of servitude, um, but there were some tropes that came up over and over again. And so for example, in the work on the left by J.C. Leyendecker, there was a trope of laziness. So mm -hmm. for example, this notion of someone um, kind of sweeping dirt under the rug and on the right hand side, um, you know, someone who serves as a porter for a wealthy white individual. These were themes that came up fairly frequently. And Lion Decker was one of the most prominent illustrators and painters, um, you know, in the 20th century. He was one of the main illustrators for um, the, the golden, age, golden Age of Illustration illustrators who were, uh, there were none of illustrators of color. He illustrated over 400 magazine covers, mainly for the Saturday Evening Post, where all of the, uh, all of the uh, Blacks and, and uh, Native Americans that he showed, which wasn't very many, they were in subservient or stereotypical roles on the cover. And Lion Decker uh, was a mentor to Rockwell. Lion Decker was about 20 years older than Rockwell. And Rockwell basically uh, subsumed his role as the main illustrator for the Saturday Evening Post um, when Lion Decker 
uh, did his last cover in the 1940s. Also, I'd like to say that that um, the images of blacks and lifestyle was was largely ignored in mainstream magazines. So that was those images were really the only ones that that mainstream Americans ever saw. Yeah. Um, during World War II, there was attention given to Dory Miller, who was a U.S. Navy cook third class who was killed in action during World War II. And he was actually the first Black American to be awarded the Navy Cross, which is the highest decoration for valor in combat. And you see him wearing the cross in the poster on the right-hand side. Um, the cartoon on the left by Charles Henry Alston refers to the fact that Miller served aboard the battleship West Virginia, which was sunk by Japanese torpedo bombers during the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. But during that attack, he helped save several soldiers. And he was actually manning um, an anti-aircraft machine gun for which he had had no training. And he, um, he did bring down uh, several Japanese planes. And um, the interesting thing is that he became a hero also in the black press mm -hmm. uh, who really viewed Miller as uh, the kind of hero that would move uh, civil rights forward. But he was ultimately killed while serving aboard, aboard the escort carrier uh, Liscombe Bay when it was sunk uh, by a Japanese submarine. So he, he, go ahead. Thank go you. Ahead, sorry. <laughs> that he, um, his image on the right, uh, he became the subject for recruiting, mm -hmm. um, a recruiting poster, as you see here, um, that pursued blacks and to, to join the military. And in, in this illustration by uh, David Stone Martin. So there were there were illustrators. Um, you know, when I was researching through this time period, I, I was wondering, like, where are all of the the black illustrators, and where and the and the illustrations. Um, so there were people like as we just discussed, uh, Charles Austin, but also Elton Fax. This is an Elton Fax piece here, and also E. Sims Campbell. Um, but most of these illustrators, if not, and others had to hide their identity to be able to work for um, any major magazines. Um, one of the treats for me as being a, a grad student up in Syracuse um, in the late 90s, I was able to meet Elton Fax who um, was a alumni of uh, Syracuse's painting department. And he also went to school with Tom Lovell. So I was thrilled when um, some curator friends of mine uh, created a solo show for Elton Fax. It was one of his last exhibitions in New York. And Eastham's Campbell is a very interesting story. Um, he was an American commercial artist. He was best known as a cartoonist. And he signed himself, uh, his work as E. Sims Campbell. Um, but he was the first African-American cartoonist uh, published in, in nationally distributed slick magazines. He was simultaneously doing work for the black press as well as, um, as I say, the Slicks. And um, he did quite a bit of work for Esquire. Uh, the piece on the right is this beautifully complex map of uh, the nightclubs in Harlem. And on the left, a very poignant piece, comical but poignant, um, of a woman trying to decide on hairstyles from a sheet that only portrays whites. He became well known for a, ser a syndicated series actually called Cuties, um, which you see here. And um, 
as I mentioned, he also did uh, a lot of work for Esquire. Uh, and I believe publications in which his work appeared were the Chicago and Cosmopolitan, Ebony, the New Yorker, Playboy, Opportunity, uh, Life, Pictorial Review, and Red Book. So he was very, very busy. And I don't think that most people knew during the time that he was a Black illustrator. Um, I think he hid most of that when he was illustrating for um, Esquire and the major um, magazines that circulated to white readership. Yes, which largely portrayed white characters, as you see here. And they were afraid they would lose their readership if people knew. So the civil rights era was a time of turbulence um, as there were boycotts, strikes, and violence in the struggle for justice and, and equity for African-Americans. Illustrations depicted main leaders of these events in drawings and comics in the black press. And also these courtroom uh, images that you see with um, Rosa Parks and Montgomery bus boycott by Harvey Dinnerstein. Yeah, Harvey Dinnerstein and Burton Silverman, um, very uh, prominent and now senior artists, uh, they actually were observers at uh, this very important event in American history when Rosa Parks was arrested and charged with disorderly combat uh, conduct on uh, December 1st, 1955, when she refused to give up her seat on a public bus to a white man. And um, they were actually present uh, in the courtroom at her trial and uh, did a series of drawings portraying these events, which are now in the collection of the Delaware Art Museum. And so these, these two pieces are, um, you know, comics of the time where um, the one on the left, uh, the Martin Luther King and Montgomery story, that was circulated worldwide. Um, Mexico and Europe. So it had wide readership. And as you can see, 10 cents um, for the publication. Um, and Tom Feelings on the right. And Tom Feelings was really uh, dedicated to trying to show people what it was like for Black families to try to own a home and dealing with ideas and concepts of, of and uh, the, the realism of redlining um, and how uh, the, the, um, the transit uh, and construction of highways would cut through neighborhoods and what was left of those um, spaces for black people to live. So this is what um, it really shows on the right. I'll just mention that the piece on the left, the Montgomery story, had tremendous impact. It was actually illustrated by Cy Barry, who had illustrated The Phantom for three decades. And he was selected to um, create the 16-page comic that was circulated very widely, um, even internationally. It was circulated to um, community organizations and churches, and it really promoted uh, Martin Luther King's uh, concept of nonviolent protest. So, um, you know, even a, a modest comic book like this had very far reach. And so these are some, some pieces by Ollie Harrington, who was a popular um, illustrator um, for the Chicago Defender. And so these images show um, sort of the plight of black children sort of growing up in these uh, cities and trying to be educated and, and um, being threatened by the police and, um, you know, just sort of navigating all of the, the pitfalls that they were um, subjected to um, during the 60s. And of course, the uh, pieces on uh, the, the left and the right really have reference to the Brown versus Board of Education ruling uh, by the su Supreme Court that stated that separate was not equal in America's public school and schools, and yet it took 
uh, quite a few years uh, before schools really began to be integrated. And that is, of course, the subject that this work by Norman Rockwell refers to. Um, this was the first artwork that Rockwell did for Look Magazine after he left the Saturday Evening po uh, Post in 1963 after 47 years. And uh, it refers to uh, the experience of uh, young Black children and specifically Ruby Bridges, who was the first to integrate the William Franz Elementary School in New Orleans in 1960. Uh, and this was published actually at the 10th anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education ruling. And Rockwell was tired of creating um, American imagery that largely ignored uh, real problems of society at the time and of civil rights movement. And he was urged by black activists Roderick Stevens to create imagery depicting Blacks in a more progressive light and more broadly show the country that um, many positive attributes of Black people. Yes, thank you, Robin. That, that was an important point. He did have direct contact um, with a number of civil rights advocates and he became a lifetime member of the NAACP. And we do have some interesting correspondence in the museum's archives relating to that but as you say, he was specifically requested to turn his talents to this subject. And I really think it got him thinking uh, about how important that would be, because at this point in his life, he really had the trust of the, you know, of many Americans. And he um, was a kind of an elder statesman. And this Emory Douglas was one of the main illustrators of the Black Panther newspaper, an instrument for social justice. The paper concentrated on the poor and oppressed. And a quote um, um, by Colette Gaither, she's my colleague at University of Delaware. He was considered uh, the Norman Rockwell of the ghetto uh, by maintaining poor people's dignity while uh, graphically illustrating the harsh uh, situations and conditions that poor people lived in. He was actually the, um, he was the Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party uh, in 1967 until it disbanded in the 1980s. Um, and, you know, I, I, much of his focus, as you may know, was, um, uh, was focused on uh, police brutality and interactions of people of color with police. And the, with the 70s, um, just brought mainstream um, Black illustration for book covers. Um, here's a piece by Charles Lilly um, on a very, very important and widely uh, circulated um, book, Malcolm X, the autobiography of Malcolm X. And this uh, piece, and um, this is a piece in the book by uh, Middle Passage by Tom Feelings. Uh, Tom Feelings spent 20 years um, on the images for this book. So he started this in the, uh, the late, uh, well, early uh, 70s. Um, and it was published in, I believe, 1995. Yeah, very, very powerful works now in the collection of the Beinecke Library at Yale University. But um, essentially, it was a book that he hoped would allow uh, people to really bear witness to the sufferings of those who were brought to um, the Americas without their consent. And Jerry Pinckney, I just want to mention um, who sadly passed away this year way too soon. Um, we are actually dedicating the exhibition and its catalog to Jerry, who we at the Norman Rockwell Museum have had tremendous good fortune to work with uh, over the course of about 20 years um, through exhibitions and programs. And, um, you know, Jerry talked a lot about 
the fact that as uh, you know, a young person growing up and even as a young artist, he really had, he did not have um, artists of color to look to or even represent or, or positive representations in books um, that he was reading. And so he really uh, made it his passion uh, to research and study and bring, um, you know, both fictional stories as well as stories of real life to light. And this is actually a cover illustration for the old African, which is a kind of a, um, a folk tale about the Igbo people who um, were brought uh, through slavery to this country, but then uh, mythically determined to travel back to their native home. I'd like to also say that Jerry Pinckney was the first black faculty member in the uh, Department of Art at the University of Delaware. So that's where I met him when I first uh, started at Delaware 25 years ago. So he was an assistant professor there and went on to, to create just these fantastic um, illustrated books and images for the world. And you know, we see that um, as Robin pointed out in many different ways in many different styles now, um, there's really beautiful work being created uh, by young artists like Lovis Wise, who's based now in California for major publications and um, important work by Rudy Gutierrez who teaches at Pratt Institute for the music industry. Um, Robin, do you wanna mention a little about Rudy? I know you know him well. <laughs> yeah, Rudy um, is an art activist um, and he's always, um, you know, making images to, to speak to everyone. Um, in this piece on the right, um, he worked with Hollis King on this as the art director. And um, I believe this piece has won the um, best uh, album cover image of the year. Yes. So, best jazz album of the year. Mm -hmm. So that, that was exciting. And we wanted to mention this trilogy uh, called March, which documents the life and times and um, work towards civil rights efforts by the late uh, Congressman John Lewis. Um, it's actually illustrated by Nate Powell. Oh. And it has come out in three volumes, the first in um, 2013, the second in 15, and the third in 2020. It's really wonderfully done and, and also packaged together so you get the entire story of his life. And you here's know, a, an interior illustration, um, which is very strong. I'm the only one still around. And now, unfortunately, he's not either. And we'll end with just a couple of works by um, the noted illustrator, Kadir Nelson. Um, this particular piece called Say Their Names was published by the New Yorker on June um, 22nd, 2020, following the murder of George Floyd. And within the figure, you can see that Kadir has uh, paid tribute both to very specific people who have um, been murdered as well as those uh, who are unnamed. And this has really become a very powerful emblem for our time and the subject that we're currently exploring. Robin, do you wanna bring up an end note? This is an, another piece by uh, Kadir Nelson. Um, and just sort of this image representing the, the wonderment and hope of um, you know, America to come and images to come. Um, and it's a you know, great value and privilege to have the skill to um, express your ideas and thoughts into illustrated, illustrated imagery. And with that privilege, 
comes the responsibility and power and influence it can have um, as a persuasive and communication, communicative tool to speak to mass audiences. To understand the power and persuasive impact illustrators have had on society's perceptions of non-whites is to study the history of race and the link between it and illustrated imagery over that period of time. So promoting ideas through the creation of imagery that celebrates, normalizes, and connects the visual story of people of color is essential to an inclusive discussion of race. Well, we, we, we have kept you all too long and we thank you so much for joining us today. Thank um, Robin, thank you for your outstanding comments and the wonderful work you're doing on this show. We're so grateful. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me to, to be a co-curator. We have um, just a couple of questions that have come in. And um, let's see, one of them is, uh, is there a plan to incorporate this beautiful work into the K to 12 ethnic studies curriculum? Um, I will just mention that, you know, very fortunately, we will be uh, creating curriculum following uh, some of the themes in this exhibition for K to 12 students. So um, yeah, we are, we're looking forward to it. Uh, looking forward to that. Yeah, for sure. Let's see what else we've got. Okay, so the one question is um, from Roger Reed, actually. Was it Stowe who commissioned Billings to illustrate um, Uncle Tom's Cabin or the publishers? Uh, Harry Beecher Stowe wanted um, Billings specifically um, for his style and his straightforward depiction of Blacks. So she was very uh, particular about that. And then Roger said, I'm unclear as to whether the miscegenation ball was fiction or just this depiction of it. It was fiction. Yeah. And in fact, the, the print, um, interestingly, in the fine print down at the bottom proclaims it to be true, <laughs> of course, <laughs> but no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it's, you know, this whole idea of, of news, people believed whatever they saw and that's where illustration became so um, powerful back then. It's because no one had television, no one had radio. So whatever was created was true, even though it wasn't necessarily. And then Brendan asks, uh, there were trade cards and advertisements that featured white people, correct? It would be interesting to see the juxtaposition between the two. Yes, in fact, that is the case. Um, and the juxtapositions are really very interesting in terms of the way that the white characters were drawn, which were much more naturalistically than the way that black characters were drawn. And most of the trade cards were um, of the time used uh, blacks because of that subservient, um, the labor. So just coming out of emancipation and who actually, you know, did labor in the country. So there were these ideals of uh, the comfort of the old South and the way things were. So people became um, comfortable in seeing those things in print. And Robin, this is one that you might want to address. Um, why were African-American characters used in marketing of food products such as syrup, uh, Aunt Jemima? Why not white American characters for those products? Do you wanna offer well, a thought about that? Yeah, namely because, um, mostly because, um, you know, again, that's the ideal of who, who cooked the food in the South and that comfort level and how those ideals moved north, um, you know, as the minstrel shows um, really had a, had a hand in that, the ideals of, of uh, plantation life and, um, you know, the mammy, the, um, who worked on the plantation. So people had these ideals of yeah, who cooked the best food and who cleaned the best houses or, or who cleaned the best in the house. And it was, 
this back to this plantation, the idea of being on the plantation. Um, so they moved those concepts over to food labels and um, products and services. Yeah, it's kind of that romant the romanticization yeah, romant yep. that even occurred in the minstrel shows exactly. that we were discussing a little bit earlier. Exactly. Yeah. And Another, it sold a lot of products. Yes, they sure did. Um, question here, how do you see these depictions of people and illustrative images over time connected to the current book, uh, push to ban children's books primarily by Black authors and illustrators? How do we, can you say that first part of the question? Yeah. How do you okay. see these depictions of people in illustrative images over time connected to a current push to ban children's books, primarily by black authors and illustrators? Yeah, it was interesting that, that um, banning books kind of comes in waves. Yeah. Um, because this isn't the first time this has come up. Um, the Daughters of the Confederacy um, campaigned at a certain time in his, I think it was the late 1800s, where they campaigned to have books banned coming from Northern publishing companies. So yeah. even books that were just printed and distributed by Northern book companies, they didn't want those ideals even in certain Southern states. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a connection through um, history repeating itself. Really, I mean, and Stephanie and I found so many um, parallels of history repeating itself. Um, illustrations for um, uh, voter suppression and, and you know, again, uh, children's books, um, you know, so it's, it's really prevalent throughout um, historical events. Yeah, I think that's an interesting aspect of this, um, you know, a, not a positive one necessarily, mm -hmm. but that so much of what we are seeing in images of the past are the very same issues that we continue mm -hmm. to recount and rehash. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people will find that um, very surprising when they see the exhibition. I think so too. Yeah. Um, I'll just mention one more from Dennis Dietrich. Uh, Dennis, thank you for that mention of Edward Campbell. Absolutely. Yeah, we, um, we didn't quite get everything in here, but uh, Edward Campbell being so important uh, as an illustrator for uh, Mark Twain and, and many others. So thank you for that. Well, we are most grateful for all the time you spent with us today. Um, we will look forward to welcoming you to the exhibition next June. If you have any questions in the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out. I can always be reached at splunkett at nrm.org and uh, convey anything to Robin. Uh, and Robin, thank you again. It's just been such an honor and a pleasure to work with you. And more to come. We are looking forward to it. I certainly thank you, everybody. Thank you.